beat. And so uh, being here today for this session is something we really appreciate. It's going to be a fantastic session. My name is Jason Morrison. I serve as the head of the CEO Water Mandate was a corporate water stewardship platform uh, that's a partnership between the Pacific Institute and the UN Global Compact. I have been at the Pacific Institute for most of my career. For those that are familiar with this organization, we're a small nonprofit, California headquartered uh, policy research and think tank uh, focusing on water and climate issues. And so today we're going to talk about a project that actually lands in California uh, through a really unique combination of uh, partners that came together, found this opportunity and moved it forward. So I'm going to do a little bit of a review and then I'm going to hand it off to our keynote speaker. Um, who is actually going to tie in virtually from uh, Southern California. We have uh, Gary Tilkian from Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, I believe the largest wholesale water provider in the United States, if not the world, maybe, actually, uh, who's going to set the scene uh, in terms of what's happening with uh, water resource management in California and the drought. Then my colleague, Cora Kammeyer, is going to give a review of the project, its scope, and how it took shape. And then we're going to have a panel discussion. Some of the supporters of the project that's going to be shepherded by our partner, BEF, Todd Reeves, uh, that's going to um, really try to explore the how this took shape and what people saw as the value and whether that's been de delivered. And then we're going to open it up for your questions and your feedback into uh, what we've been doing. And then I'm going to try my best to synthesize some of the key outcomes of, of this discussion so that you have names to faces. Uh, Gary in Southern California, Cora here to my right, uh, Todd uh, with Bonneville Environment Foundation, Shannon Quinn from Procter & Gamble, and Tara Vergazzi from uh, Google. And so let us get going. And with that, I'm going to hand directly to Gary. All right. Thanks, All right, very, thanks much. very much. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, I think, to you all. We're just starting our day here in Southern California. And if you'll give me a moment, I will put uh, my presentation on the screen. Okay, just to double check, can you see all, all see that okay? Ooh, we had you on the screen. Now we're back onto the slide. No, that's his, that's his, that's his slide. slide. That's his slide. Okay. Great. All right, so <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, allowing me to join you all virtually. Uh, I get the pleasure of talking about a uh, situation that's making a lot of people uh, a little bit uncomfortable, but it's something that is very important and we need to grapple with it. As far as I know, based on a lot of the news reports I'm hearing, California and Southern California is not the only place that is dealing with climate change. Uh, I will go ahead and set the stage for this panel. I think you'll find this panel uh, very interesting. So a little bit about California. <clears throat> uh, we are on the far left side of the United States there. You can see uh, our average annual precipitation varies quite a bit. Uh, the mismatch is that most of the rain falls in the northern part of the, uh, of the state and the, the higher population is in the southern part. And so we actually have some fairly large water projects that move water around in our state to meet both the urban and agricultural needs. Uh, and the figure on the right, um, you can see in terms of rainfall variability, much of the rest of, of the United States has very little variation. They, they know when their rain is coming. If you look at California and in particular, Southern California, highly, highly variable. And this we've known for a long time. The problem is that uh, this is being exacerbated. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the drought monitor. And I just wanna show you that uh, the Western United States, again, you know it's highly variable in terms of rainfall and uh, both snow and rain. Um, the Western United States has been in fairly severe and in some places extreme drought for a while. And California in particular, if you look at the last three years, uh, we've had three years of very, very dry, very low precipitation. Um, and, and that's interesting in this context, 
If you were to put a sequence of three years together and look through our state's history, uh, the, basically the historical record of precipitation in three year uh, uh, cycles, um, an area that is really key for us in terms of understanding and planning on water supplies, uh, the last three years have been the uh, lowest amount of precipitation uh, that we've seen in that record for three consecutive years. So something's definitely happening uh, in terms of our state uh, water project, Northern California water supplies. Uh, we are really experiencing some, uh, some tough times right now. So California has a population of about 40 million people. Economy is Currently, I think ranked around the fifth largest in the world if it was to stand alone. And obviously we're a major producer of uh, uh, agriculture, fruits and nuts that go across the country, if, if not across the, uh, through much of the world, fourth, fourth largest wine producer in the world. So obviously very significant metropolitan water district. We're in that Southern coastal portion of the state. Uh, and you can see uh, our, our service area in the, in the colored sections on the right. Those are our direct member agencies. Those are our customers. We provide uh, supplemental water supplies to about 19 million people. So roughly half of the people in the state supporting a fairly large economy. Again, in this region, if it were to stand alone, uh, currently ranks around 11th in the world. So um, water supplies are very important to this area. I mentioned the state water project. Um, typically, we import water and get about 30% of our, uh, our, our demand through that system from Northern California, somewhere around 25 or 30% uh, from the Colorado River. And the rest of the balance of that is made up of local supplies. Um, that does include some other aqueducts, particularly for Los Angeles but mostly recycling, groundwater development, uh, and some desalination and conservation. Again, looking at the Northern, uh, Northern California State Water Project supply, uh, this, this supply is stressed. And I mentioned the last three year sequence, you can see up in the top right there, Lake Oroville, the major reservoir for that particular system uh, is very, very low. Uh, down in the lower left, uh, our snow surveys, typically when the folks go out and measure the snow and the water content, they're standing on six to eight, if not 10 feet of snow. And you can see that's certainly not the case uh, this last April. Um, the reservoirs are low and continuing to drop because we're in the, the hot part of the year in the summer. And even though we have some significant cutbacks uh, that have gone into effect, we're still seeing those supplies continue to drop. On the Colorado River, um, you can see both Lake Powell and Lake Mead are low. They're actually at their lowest points since they started filling. Um, we, for the first time last year, uh, the basin states that take water from the Colorado River um, started to see mandatory shortages and cutbacks, and we anticipate that that's going to continue. So we are in a lot of discussions right now trying to figure out how we can best do that uh, as equitably as possible uh, for the states that rely on that water. So there is some good news. We've been able to actually reduce our per capita water use quite a bit over the last several decades. Much of that is due to conservation, some codes and regulations, educating folks on where their water comes from and why they need to be careful about how they use it. And this has helped, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're out of the woods. We still have some challenges, as I mentioned, we have mandatory cutbacks on outdoor irrigation right now in some areas that are particularly susceptible to um, shortage on the state water project. So you're gonna hear about uh, 
some interesting collaboration today. The Metropolitan Water District has a suite of conservation programs, incentives, and rebates. One program in particular, the Water Savings Incentive Program, is one of the uh, key components to this collaboration. When uh, we started talking with the Pacific Institute about trying to set up some kind of a project, they asked us what kinds of incentives Metropolitan might be able to bring to the table. And we thought that this program would probably best fit uh, ultimately what their objectives <clears throat> were. And uh, so one of the, Metropolitan is one of the funding partners for this program. We were able to provide funds through this program. It's basically a pay for performance program. Uh, we see what your water use is on your site before your project. We measure the water use afterwards and we pay an incentive based on that difference. It's actually pretty simple, but we see a lot of different kinds of projects. And really the neat thing about this is it's, it's really only limited by uh, your creativity. Um, we don't require any particular certain kind of thing to happen or a device or technology to be used. We just wanna see that you're using water more efficiently. And so to wrap up, um, as we go forward, uh, we, we're not gonna get away from uh, regulations. That certainly is, is one of the, the tools in our toolbox, but we are hoping to uh, implement some system improvements, both on a utility scale uh, and um, uh, regional scales. We're working on continuing to develop local supplies. Obviously conservation is a big part uh, and one of our, our uh, more creative tools in the toolbox. And then um, along those lines, we're really kind of hoping to push more climate appropriate landscapes. Some of you may have heard of our turf removal and turf replacement programs. Uh, during the last drought, Metropolitan spent somewhere in the neighborhood of $350 million just on turf removal incentives alone. And uh, we're already seeing, seeing um, applications for the current program starting to ramp up during this current drought. Uh, we embrace and really want to foster innovation. The Water Savings Incentive Program uh, actually uh, does really embrace creative solutions. And obviously we are very interested in collaborating wherever we can uh, whether it's with the Pacific Institute or some of the energy utilities or any other potential partners out there to help fund and drive both the creativity and water conservation. So I believe that wraps up my portion. early in California, maybe even before coffee. So appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. And if we can switch the slides back to this deck. Great. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cora Kammeyer, and I'm a senior researcher at the Pacific Institute. Um, and a lot of my work is focused on bringing together public and private sectors across the Western United States to advance innovative solutions to shared water challenges. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, a particular project where we leverage this innovative incentive program from Metropolitan Water District, as well as corporate contributions to a leak detection project that fixes toilet leaks in multifamily housing. Um, and as you just heard from Gary, we are in dire need of more faster, more innovative solutions um, to water challenges in California and in other parts of the world. Um, so that's what I want to talk about today. But before I get into the details of the project, I want to back up a little bit and talk about how this project really came to be. Um, and I'm going to kind of start way, way back in and take you along the ride with uh, this journey. So. We heard from Gary about the extreme drought in California. And when there's water shortages and water scarcity, this presents risks to businesses that have operations, supply chains, customer bases in that region. And we tend to think of risk along these three dimensions. This is a graphic from the CEO water mandate. 
physical risk of drought, not having enough water to sustain your operations, reputational risk of being seen as a bad actor or flagrant water user in times of shortage, and regulatory risks, risk of you know, mismanagement by the public sector or of cuts to your water allocations that impact business. So in response to these risks, companies are increasingly setting more and more ambitious water stewardship targets and goals. And this is not only in response to risk, but also in response to increasing you know, investor and consumer pressure to act responsibly in the face of these changes that we're seeing. Um, and let me shift the notes here. So we have here on, on the slide examples from Procter and Gamble and Google, who we'll also hear from on the panel, um, who both have ambitious water stewardship strategies um, and are also both engaged in collection act, collective action efforts to achieve those goals and mitigate the risks that their companies face. And this is really what we're seeing is that leading companies are investing in collective action projects to help meet their water stewardship goals. Um, and taking this collective action approach um, and participating in these collaborative projects can help present and drive demonstrable impacts in these water stress regions. And I wanna talk about a particular collective action initiative in California that's called the California Water Action Collaborative. And those of us who will be speaking today are all part of this initiative. Uh, QUAC was founded in response to California's last big drought in 2014, when we were really starting to see you know, similar conditions to what we're facing now, you know, extreme drought and, and, and risks to business rising. Um, and there was this coalition of businesses and nonprofits that wanted to work together to figure out how can we collectively work on projects that can have an impact on these drought conditions. So since then, Quack has grown into an organization um, or a collective platform of over 25 different businesses and nonprofits that uh, you know, learn together, that invest in projects together, um, and that are really driving innovative solutions to California's water challenges. So over time, our approach to collective action and to addressing shared water challenges has matured from more opportunistic to more strategic over the you know, now seven years that Quack has been in existence. Um, we have about a dozen active collective action projects uh, across the state, you can see here on the map. Um, and these really range from ecosystem projects like mountain meadow restoration, agricultural product projects like um, on-farm groundwater recharge, regenerative agriculture, uh, to more urban projects like urban green infrastructure or like the urban water efficiency project that I'm gonna talk about shortly. So two years ago, a subset of Quack members that were particularly interested in Southern California we got together to explore new project ideas for that region. Um, and we went through this collaborative decision-making process that is informally called the funnel approach that you see here on the screen, really looking at you know, how can we have this structure for a conversation that helps lead us to projects that are you know, addressing water challenges in the region where we're operating and also uh, meeting corporate water stewardship goals, um, projects that nonprofit partners that public sector partners can all participate in and you know really starting at this high level of okay what are the key water challenges and what kinds of water benefits do we want to see what are the co-benefits that are important to this we all know that water touches on so many other issues that are important to us and so how do we make those connection points and then there's the practicalities right do our you know budgets align do our timelines align how do we actually practically make this happen um, and then there's also the considerations of you know, what projects are most inspiring and interesting to folks and how, what story can we tell and how does that fit in? So going through this process led us to the kinds of opportunities that we wanted to pursue in Southern California. Um, and one of those ended up being this leak detection project. So at a high level, this is a cross-sector water efficiency project where nonprofit organizations, you know, public water agencies and corporations came together to advance an innovative technological solution to a sneaky but really persistent water waste, which is leaky toilets. And it's, you know, not that fun to talk about toilets, but this is a water conference. And so we all know how important it is. Um, and there was really a ton of opportunity, specifically looking in multifamily housing, where we have many different residential units, lots of toilets that are typically on one water meter. 
and many different residents and trying to detect and fix leaks in large multifamily buildings is a persistent challenge. And so that's what we are trying to address in this project. Um, and I'm gonna tell you now a little bit about the partners that brought this project together, how the technology actually works, and then the results from our first project, which was at MacArthur Park Tower in Los Angeles. So first, the partners. I'm gonna summarize these from left to right. And we have the uh, project incubators and leaders. I talked about how this project idea came out of the California Water Action Collaborative. And then we, as the Pacific Institute and CEO Water Mandate, we're leading this project in partnership with BEF, Bonneville Environmental Foundation. And BEF play, has played this really critical role of um, facilitating the corporate partnerships and funding. And so that's you know, kind of the, the paperwork and the financial aspect of this, but also the trust-based relationships with the corporate funders. Who you can see here in the blue box in the middle, there are five different corporations that contributed to the project, all of whom are also members of Plaque. And we have representatives from Google and Procter and Gamble with us today, and you'll hear from them in just a little bit. Then in the green box, we have the project implementers. So Sensor Industries is the company that actually provides the sensor technology that goes on every toilet in the building. Um, and Retirement Housing Foundation is the nonprofit affordable housing group that owns the building. And then Bottom Line Utility Solution is essentially the matchmaker between Sensor Industries and Retirement Housing Foundation. Lastly, we have our utility partners. You just heard from Gary at Metropolitan Water District. So Metropolitan played a critical role here, both as helping to generate ideas for this project and build some of these relationships. And then also, as you heard, they have this innovative incentive program that's a pay for performance rebate. Um, and then the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power has a similar program. So we are actually able to leverage rebates from both of those water utilities to help support this project. All right. So now for some of the technical details about how the toilet sensor actually works. So in June of 2021, Sensor Industries installed leak sensors on every toilet in MacArthur Park Tower, 183 in total. Um, and these sensors go in line on the toilet between the toilet and the water supply line. Um, and they essentially can detect leaks by measuring the flow of the water. So they can detect what it means to you know, have the toilet flush once, but if they're getting those sustained flows coming through, then they can detect that's a leak, either a stuck open flapper or a leaky flapper and can actually detect so not only if there's a leak, but how much water is being wasted and even what kind of leak for each sensor. So that results in you know, every unit in the building having this equipped. Um, the sensors operate on this wireless network and they're battery operated. And so the sensor itself lasts over 10 years. The battery has to be changed every two to five years. And they're all connected to an online dashboard that then the project or the uh, property managers and maintenance team can have on their phone or their tablet, their computers to see leak alerts. They can customize, you know, how those pop up for them. And then they also have a dashboard that allows them to monitor the system as a whole. All right. So then how did deploying this project go or this uh, product go for our first project at MacArthur Park Tower? What we saw was a 27% reduction in total building water use just from detecting and catching leaky toilets. And this was pretty astonishing to us. We were expecting actually more like a 15 to 20% uh, savings. And so 27% was, was pretty incredible. And what's really remarkable here is that over the course of the last year or so, there were about 20 leak alerts. That's all it took. It wasn't like this was happening all over the place. There were a few basically catastrophic silent leaks happening, wasting tons of water that the building maintenance teams had no idea about. And what we actually found in the context of this building that was kind of unique is that um, the demographics mattered in the water savings. This was a, a senior population and predominantly English as a second language population. And so there was already kind of communication issues between the property managers and the tenants. And so not having to rely on that communication was really uh, beneficial for this building in particular. And then these water savings resulted in water bill savings and cost savings. So we see about $30,000 of cost savings per year 
from this technology. And we see that both on the water cost side and the wastewater cost side. And while in this case, the project was funded by external partners, we did do a cost benefit analysis, you know, kind of cost effectiveness if the building had paid for this themselves. And we estimate that the payback period would have been about 11 months and the lifetime net present value of the technology is about $150,000. Um, so as I touched on, you know, in addition to saving water, this is also helping the building maintenance teams and property managers with their, you know, efficiency and workflow. And this is a direct quote from the property manager at MacArthur Park Tower. You're just emphasizing that the fact that they don't have to rely on residents to let them know about leaky toilets has been a huge help and that now they're able to, through this platform, be able to identify and fix leaks as soon as they see them. So in summary, this project has an array of benefits. You know, it's, it saves a lot of water. Um, it's also saving energy. You know, Southern California's water supply is actually extremely energy intensive because it relies on so much imported water. So there's a water energy nexus there. You know, it's supporting a low income nonprofit owned housing. Um, and we've talked about, you know, the innovative aspects of this in terms of both the technology and the partnerships that made it happen. So the project was recently recognized by the Los Angeles Better Buildings Challenge, challenge uh, winning the Water Innovation Award this year. And I'm hoping that we might be able to play a short video um, from that award. Do we know if the audio will, should work on here? Okay, let's give it a shot. If I can find the mouse. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I'm not sure if it's not playing when I click through the center. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm not being able to get the video to play right now. So um, the link is up here on the screen if you want to check it out later. I guess we'll have to skip that for now. Um, so I'll just wrap up with my concluding remarks, which is that, you know, the success of this first pilot project has led to, you know, increased interest and heightened interest from our, you know, original pool of corporate funders. And we are now expanding to other places within California and the United States. And I'm happy to say that both Procter & Gamble and Google are continuing to support this project and scaling it up with Procter & Gamble supporting more expansion in Los Angeles and Google supporting um, scaling out north to San Francisco. Um, and we also now have pilots in the works in New York City and Austin, Texas as well. So it's exciting to see this grow. Um, and with that, I will hand it to Todd Reeve. Okay, give me a shot. Oh, I can't find the mouse. Yeah, it's we can, we can do that maybe at the end if we have time. But for now, uh, let's move on to the panel discussion. So Todd, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks so much, Cora. I'm going to invite our panelists up to this front row positioning here. Um, I'm Todd Reeve with the Bonneville Environmental Foundation and uh, run a program called Business for Water Stewardship. I'm really privileged to be a part of this project team, and I'm grateful to the panelists and to Cora for including my organization in this work. And it's a great privilege to present here today to you all. So thank you for that opportunity. I'm told for the panel that we're going to pass this mic around and just advance notice when we get to the question and answer. I think we'll need to pass the mic around for live questions to help with the hybrid audience. So just so everyone knows some of the logistics. So um, I think this is the panel we've all been waiting for. This is sort of the dream team, an incredible set of people. I'm incredibly excited to see what information we can get out of them. You see their bios up above, but I just want to represent, these are amazing individuals that are leading 
innovative, cutting edge water stewardship with their companies, with their organizations. And because of their participation and partnership, we were able to pull together an incredibly unlikely and improbable project. And we'll dive into that a little bit. So thank you for the opportunity to moderate and um, we'll, we'll jump in right here. So starting out, um, Shannon and Tara lead incredibly complex water stewardship programs for their companies. And I think it'd be beneficial just to hear from them brief background on what is our strategy, what are their goals, and how does a project like this toilet leak detection fit into that? And if, Shannon, if you'd be willing to kick us off. Sure. Um, I guess it doesn't amplify, but everyone can hear it on the screen. Okay, cool. All right. Hi, everyone. Shannon. Um, I'm a Procter & Gamble's Global Water Stewardship Leader um, based in the U.S., but we have a footprint all over the world. We sell in eight, uh, 100, over 180 countries around the world. Um, some of our brands, we have Tide or Ariel. We have uh, Oral-B, Head & Shoulders, Pampers, um, hopefully some products that you have in your home as well. Um, for us, we just announced our new water strategy. It's our water positive future strategy. And we're really focused on three specific areas. We want to reduce water in manufacturing. We want to restore more water in water stressed regions or restore water in water stressed regions. And then we're also focused on responding to water challenges through innovation and partnership. So this project uh, fits right into that strategy. It actually covers two of our areas and helps us progress towards both restoring water in water stressed areas. We have 18 water stressed areas we're focused on and one of them is around Los Angeles. And then uh, also responding to challenges through innovation and partnership. This is both, both innovative and um, a new and, and a new partnership, an innovative partnership at that. So um, this project, from the very beginning, I uh, was really interested in, in, in seeing it through, and um, it aligns great, perfectly to our strategy. And in addition, it's in people's homes, and that's where we are. And so it, it was like, it, you know, very strongly connected to what we do, our products, and our consumers. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I'm Tara Varghese. I am with Google. I lead our water stewardship program in our global sustainability office. Last year, Google announced our um, updated water stewardship strategy, um, a similar kind of three pillar strategy. The first one being advancing responsible water use in our own operations. The second pillar being benefiting the communities and ecosystems where we operate. And then the third pillar is sorry, utilizing technology and products and putting them in service of advancing water security goals. Um, so for us, you know, California is obviously our home. Um, we heard from Gary the, the context of the, the current drought situation in the state, um, but this particular project fit in really well for us um, with our replenishment commitment, where under our second pillar, we've committed to replenish 120% of the water we consume um, by 2030. So from a volumetric water perspective, there are obvious water savings from this type of project, but also in terms of benefiting the communities where we're operating, um, a really clear linkage to supporting the communities um, in, in Southern California. Fabulous, thanks Tara. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot here to what I think is really the most interesting component of this work, and and Cora spoke to it, but I'm just gonna reference. This is a very complex project. Um, it requires rebates from utility partners and collaboration. It requires companies to invest in, frankly, an idea or a concept. It requires nonprofits to manage complex contracting between technical service providers, multifamily building owners. And so really this was born out of an idea and inspiration that this hard to address sector could be solved through collaborative integration of these different partners. But if anything, from a corporate perspective, it wasn't entirely clear how this was gonna play out. We didn't know how much water could be saved and, and Cora pointed out 27%, so far beyond our expectations. How long would it take to find the results? What would the, the payback on the project be? Could this be scaled up? So a tremendous amount of uncertainties, and at least in my personal experience working with companies, 
uncertainty is not what companies like. They like a very buttoned up, clear path toward their role, timeline, and expected outcomes. So I'm going to turn, I'll first turn to Jason. Um, this is a really complex and novel project, Jason, with, with many uncertainties regarding how it would play out, relying on multiple different parties to serve in, in different roles that many of them had never served in before. So as you looked at it as an instrumental partner, as a, a leader for water stewardship in the state and elsewhere, what made this concept compelling so that it could fit within your view of how your organization can participate and, and elevate your goals and manage risks that you would have associated with something like this? Yeah, for for us, the the notion that this could be a transformational type of project was a driver right out of the gates because you know the 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 threshold of whether something can be scaled is kind of now a starting point for us of whether this is worth chasing. But if you can think about if this works, how how much could this be expanded not only in Southern California but other parts of the U.S. and elsewhere? So that part is a major driver, even though there was uncertainty and we couldn't quantify some of the benefit. That was important. Some of the really awesome aspects of this project, though, out of the gates, you may remember the funnel uh, slide that Cora put up. There was a real interest in, in two years ago when this was taking shape in trying to find projects that had a social equity dimension to them. And so when we were looking at projects that not only have a water quantity benefit, but also one that could be implemented in places that could actually benefit the communities uh, that are uh, in a disadvantaged uh, situation. And so that's why we selected a nonprofit run um, low income housing house, because then you could think that the benefits are this savings that are realized are actually either directly or indirectly working its way back to the uh, residents of the of the of the um, uh, residents. So the third thing is, you know, we're all in this, this new world of climate change and its impact on water. And so for us, the looking at projects that potentially are climate resilient projects, this is water that's inside the system already. This is water that was moved across the state in order to get there in some cases, like you can't count the drops. But so if you can find ways to not have that water be wasted, you're, you're actually, this is foregoing the need to bring new water into Southern California, if you see what I mean. So when you look at different sorts of conservation strategies, some may or may not be uh, as climate resilient as others. So these were all motivators for us to see, let's see how we can make this work. Let's um, build on the relationships that the Pacific Institute has with the public sector and uh, utilities in uh, California and see if we can conceptualize this in a way that provides these wins. And what I love so much about the project afterwards is the ROI is really clear. And therefore, you have a, a, like the inherent scaling built into it, right? Everyone's going to see that this is this makes sense in terms of climate resilience, social impact, uh, and also uh, the cost savings. Well, that's a tough one to follow, Jason. You covered uh, some really compelling points. Tara or Shannon, would you want to jump in from your perspective? The question, absolutely, of course. Um, so. This project had um, a fair amount of uncertainty associated with it. It was sort of presented as a concept with um, a number of pathways that Jason described that we now know played out very favorably. But as a business that's that's attempting to manage risk and have extreme amounts of clarity regarding what you're investing in and, and what you're going to get out of it, can you talk about what made it compelling or easy to engage in? Because it is complex with a lot of different partners. Yeah, um, I I think when I was reflecting on on the beginning to the end as we were preparing for the session, I think there are really two things um, that emerged. One was the trust and relationships that were already built through Quack. Um, I mean, I like new Pacific Institute and specifically Cora, and I'd seen successful projects realized before. And um, yes, it was very complex, but uh, somehow they simplified it, right? And like, we're very transparent about the potential risks. And so I think that that, that trust and the relationship that was built allowed us to feel 
good and confident that that this project would be realized and, and be successful and had a high potential to scale. Um, I think the second one um, was uh, really like it, the, the innovation of it as well and the direct tie to our business. So we um, are working with people in homes. Uh, we, we provide our products to people living in their homes where our products are in their homes and we uh, work to provide innovations inside of the homes. And so it was very clearly tied and, and um, relatively easy to see how over time you could expand, right? From toilet leak detection to water efficient fixtures to education, right? So it's like you can build upon it and, and scale this. And that's another part that we were looking for that those the responding to these challenges through innovation and partnership. Um, and then of course, uh, I guess I'll add a third is the fact that this was a pilot but was also uh, also a vision painted on how it could scale. So pilots are are often easier for companies to kind of, okay, let's let's put a little bit towards this and effort towards this and see what happens um, and then commit to more once we see the success and once we are able to learn from it. So I think the the trust, the relationships, the innovative piece and the direct tie to the business, uh, to our business in particular, and um, also... Uh, the the nature of it, the fact that it was a pilot, that we would start small, learn, and then there was an intention to scale. Yeah. And I think Shannon and Jason covered it well. I would just really emphasize the scalability aspect of this because Todd, you're right. There was a lot of uncertainty in terms of not knowing what the outcomes would be or not knowing how successful these interventions would be, but thinking about how you know relatively simple a concept this was and how readily accessible and replicable it could be in so many different locations um, that that made it quite a compelling opportunity. Fabulous. So I, I really appreciate that. And I think it um, underscores the uniqueness of some of the companies that participated, thinking about impact, thinking about scaling, thinking about how early investment had the potential to really increase the overall outcome of a project like this. Um, so I appreciate that. So I want to pivot just a little bit here um, and think about this project, but also other projects that we all have worked on or thought about or tried to move forward and think about the concept of barriers, especially barriers that affect the ability to align um, different entities, different contributors, different allies to these sorts of solutions. And so I look at this one and I think, companies, partners that were willing to step up and try something new, the easy entry point, the trust, the, the clear pathway to potential scale. But at the same time, we all know the challenges that exist in trying to pull those alliances together. Even when we have those opportunities in front of us, it's difficult. So I'd love to ask the panelists to talk about what are some of the barriers to pulling together these alliances? And maybe this project, a perfect example, or maybe there are other projects and we have similar components of the work that prevent sort of bringing those folks together. Anyone that would want to take a uh, first shot at that barriers to building these alliances Tara thank you yeah I think one of the one of the things about developing projects like this is just the recognition that it takes a long time to establish the relationships establish that trust and bring these unlikely partners together to develop and co-create a solution that's kind of tackling a shared vision and shared goals and I really credit Pacific Institute and BEF and others who are in this space who do so much of that legwork um, because, you know, it could take months, years before a project comes to us on the corporate side um, and presented for consideration. And I think it's really important not to underestimate the, the amount of time and effort and resources it can take to develop these opportunities um, and it's it's a it's a barrier with the solution because of the good work that these teams are doing. I think just to kind of build on that, um, and maybe not directly in California, but in some geographies, it's actually um, not possible for companies to work directly with governments or agencies, and so also 
that, um, you know, we, we want to, right. Like that's a way to scale and a way to kind of like get at the bigger issue. And, um, and this created a pathway like Pacific Institute and Cora specifically, I'll just call her out. She's done an amazing job with this project, um, has really, really helped to create that pathway towards the collaboration and the fact that, it, yeah, it's an unlikely partnership because it doesn't happen often. Sometimes it's not allowed. Sometimes it's a little uncomfortable. Um, you don't, and so that those that barrier was taken down here. Yeah, I'm, Shannon mentioned it as trust and the relationships. There's this concept or phrase of relational capital, and there's, I think this project relied on relational capital to get off the ground faster. A lot of times when you have to build that relationship between the utility or the, uh, or the, uh, the agencies uh, on the ground, if they don't really understand the motivations of the different project partners. So being able to build off of that. I will also say that in other contexts, one of the, um, one of the barriers that I've noticed is that projects have to be cost competitive when it comes to what kind of benefits or savings for water comes out of them. And that, and I, that's understandable, especially if, uh, if the corporate partners have goals that they've established about what they want to uh, achieve in terms of alleviating water quantity stress in a region. So that makes sense. But the reality also is that many of these projects have great co-benefits that come out of them that are not tangible or not quantifiable always. And they're not necessarily, they're out of scope of how some of that decision-making criteria works. And this project's a great example of how it had a social benefit. Uh, it also had a resilience, a climate resilience benefit, none of which we could really quantify, but we all just knew that this was a good project because it had these other dimensions. And I think there are other project examples in other locations, they don't get off the ground because the return on investment for the volumetric benefit isn't there as compared to a project you could do source water protection project up basin and get you know 10 times more water for the same spend and so that's a that's a real barrier i think in the space generally and to credit to the corporate partners in this project to really saw those co-benefits as being valuable and also willing to take the chance even though we couldn't quantify some of those benefits that we knew would would realize but we couldn't give that firm calculation of what we can expect out of it so it takes a little bit of trust that way as well Super helpful. One other thing I know the, the panelists had mentioned in the preparation for this session was a willingness to reach out to unusual partners in the first place and share ideas and concepts of what could be. And I think on this project in particular, the collective action of the team sort of reaching out and exploring in advance and just finding out who is willing to participate was a, a big component on that. So pivot maybe kind of toward the end of the panel discussion here a little bit. Um, we think about where to go next. And when, when I say that, maybe this project, we talked about opportunity to scale it in Los Angeles, new um, low income, underserved communities, new parts of the state, Texas, New York, other locations, but also thinking about the quack, the corporate collaboration, this concept of unlikely alliances. How do we pivot? How do we scale? How, you know, where do we go next with that concept? So I'll open up sort of either sides of that path. I think a lot has been accomplished with this project. In some ways, we're really fortunate that it was as strong as it turned out to be and was so replicable and had these early benefits. We know there's a lot of circumstances where that isn't the case, right? And it's harder work to get there. So where do we go from here with this project, with this concept, with these types of alliances? How do we overcome those barriers? How do we continue to generate forward progress in this work? Anyone want to kick that off? Um, so I think, uh, like if, if at the beginning of this project, we closed our eyes and imagined the exact presentation you got, that's what we wanted. So it was like the, the best or better outcomes. And it did exactly what we wanted, which is basically showcase the success quant, like actually capture the, the benefits or a range of benefits. And not only that, but it also, you know, because of that won an award, that we could then bring into our, our own businesses and talk about like, look, look at the innovation, look at this project, the success and the scalability. So I do think the next immediate step is to practice and figure out, well, how do you scale it? How do you put it into a nice little package so that any city could pick it up and replicate it? Or if a company 
um, feels so inclined, they could also work with another partner to to replicate that in 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 any area that had uh, leaky toilets, right? So that's like a lot of places, um, and uh, and and yeah, like it, we this this happened. We have the benefits, and because of that, uh, as Cora mentioned, P and G is is going going at it again. We're we're investing, and in not only that, but one of our brands was really interested in also participating and scaling this up. And so our Cascade dishwashing brand, along with P&G, uh, the corporate side of P&G will be supporting the expansion of the project in Los Angeles. And we'll also be trying out additional things. So putting in water efficient fixtures to see what kinds of savings we can get from that. Um, and uh, along with the, the, the high, you know, 27% hopefully um, savings in the toilet. So I think that that's just kind of what will keep happening and do it paced, like not get too far ahead of ourselves, but see how, how we can scale it, keep practicing, maybe add a couple things on, add partners who also seem interested and, and see how it works in different places. So. I think also, you know, at first glance, if someone talks about a toilet leak project, it might not seem like the most exciting or you know, exciting initiative to support or to choose. But we heard from Gary on the, the context, again, of the California drought. Everyone sees what's happening around the world. In that light, there are so many hard decisions and difficult trade-offs that need to be made. And this is just such an easy win-win decision. You know, it's helping residents' utility bills, saving water, and also you know, reducing supply demand on stressed utilities. And it's a good reminder that, you know, this is the type of activity that can be scaled and should really be implemented everywhere. So we're, we're starting that scaling process now, but it's a good reminder also just to think of those other kind of small and simple things that we might not always, you know, they might not always come to mind at, at first or initially, but to, to think of who those partners might be who could collaborate um, on solutions like this. Yeah, I think geographic expansion of the same project is a no-brainer for the reasons that we've learned about today. Um, but I also think the point that Cora made about this project pays for itself even if it didn't have that innovative seed funding from corporates. And so I think that story needs to be shared widely to get others to adopt this on their own faster. <laughs> so that's part of scaling. But I also think there's a lot of opportunity to build out the scope of this project. You touched upon, you know, right now it's the maintenance person coming in, fixing the flapper, right? But if while you're in there, you can put aerators on the sink or uh, on the shower head and get those savings right out of the, out of the gates, or if it's really a suboptimal toilet in terms of flush per gallon anyways, why don't you just remove it? You know, at that point, once it's broken, that could be the staging of new introduction of, of projects. So all of those can be added over time as we do this, but those are the logical ways that I think scaling can add even more benefit that the tenants themselves may see a financial return on, not just the building owner. Super helpful. Back to the panel, is there potential to take a pilot like this and use the influence of NGOs and companies to actually change codes? Jason or someone I think mentioned, you know, at some point this could be required in all new buildings. Is, is that a pathway for scale and impact? Yeah, I mean, that too, I was actually thinking of marketing, basically selling the idea, you guys should be doing this. But you know, using uh, policy incentives or more of a, a policy expectation around what new buildings uh, is also another pathway to scaling. I think, I don't know if the time lag is as efficient as the just, you guys should be doing this because we're in a drought and this is really fast and you can do it. But I think they're both viable strategies. Do you have a view on this on the policy side? Yeah, no, I mean, I think another thing maybe we didn't fully touch on was that this was collaborative right like for, for we had a small group within quack that was interested in co-developing something and that the idea also was brought and we were we just all discussed it and input it on it and everything which i think is another reason why all of all of the members felt invested in it from the very beginning 
Um, but in those conversations, that was definitely something that we discussed is, okay, how can in future phases, we also look at the policy influencing um, and additional ways to scale impact. So we were going to shift to an incredible audience participation component that was going to be realized digitally, and I don't think that's going to happen. So the official instructions were to wing it for me. Um, so we'll just solicit a little bit of feedback from the audience and then jump over to questions for the panels here. Um, but I'd love, and I'm not sure how to do this, but maybe, I don't know, raise a hand or shout it out, but just kind of a popcorn We'll pass the mic around. Um, Cora, thank you for helping with that. But would love to hear, if possible, when we think about these allies, these partners that it maybe are lacking or that could be instrumental to making greater progress in water security, water resilience, or your goals, are there some entities that jump out? You know, is it agencies, is it governments, is it tribes, is it NGOs, is it communities? Um, what are some of these alliances? What are some of these entities that folks in the audience would say, you know, this would be amazing if, if these sorts of individuals or, or entities were partnering? Yeah, yes, uh, thank you, Tom Dyer from Antea Group. I, I don't have the exact answer, but it's related to a question I actually had because I have the impression the government is a bit, is not very active in there. I might be wrong about that, but it, I've seen it also in other presentations this uh, yesterday and today where corporates are doing a lot at basin scale, landscape scale, where you would expect that's actually the work of a government. Uh, and so where are these two coming together and how do you, is that coordinated between what is government already doing, what is corporate, where can corporate step in to reinforce, to strengthen what government is doing and to align these? Questions? Yeah, we'll just take a few and then we'll work through here if that's okay. Um, so the question is, especially I think related to this project or California, yeah, where does the government role end and begin and where does it intersect and how should it? That's a great question. Back there. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Lawrence and I work at the Global Water Partnership. Um, thank you for this excellent presentation and really great um, collaborative work around, around this initiative. Uh, I guess my question would be quite similar and it relates to your topic is what about the role of the actual residents uh, in this um, and how was this project communicated to them? Um, and the reason I'm asking is um, you mentioned that a lot of those weren't English speakers uh, for the most part. And, um, and just reading over the quote, it said something like, uh, I received a text on my my phone, and then I went in the apartment and I fixed it. Right. Um, so thinking about you know some elderly citizen who's probably in their sixties, seventies, having the janitor come in and say, hey, "I'm going to fix your your toilet." It might be a bit scary. So how did you deal with that um, sort of communication with uh, with the local residents? And um, back to your last point that you made around uh, maybe like scalability of fixes within the home. Did you also use then that opportunity to communicate with the residents to say um, like behavior communication change around, uh, well, you know, we're installing these things uh, at the same time, you know, think about using less because actually, I mean, it doesn't matter the the techno quick fix that we do if you leave the the shower open, then, you know, you're still going to use a lot of water. So yeah, a bit more about that uh, relationship and that communication with, with the people, because that's also an important part of it. Anyone want to throw one more in before we start diving into these questions? Thank you very much for that question. Hello, uh, I'm Khulud Ridi from also on Peer Group. Um, actually, my question is more directly to the corporate, like uh, as a government, as someone working in the government or in a small business uh, scale model, how can we communicate with the corporate to convince them to work on such uh, projects that uh, uh, that deals with the with the water uh, droughts or with the water with the environmental uh, with that have environmental impacts. Okay, so coming back to the panel, just to refresh, role of government, where, where does that intersection begin and end? Um, the role of the residents and the communication to residents, opportunity to communicate further. And I think making the business case to, to companies and bringing in more engagement from private sector and companies. 
So I'm going to not answer the last question. I'll expect and hope that you guys can. There was there there was public sector engagement in the sense that there there was a match that came out of the utility for the the um, savings and the impacts that were benefits that were realized, and there are. California is in a drought. There are other statewide policy decisions that are coming about, one on um, a mandate around turf removal and commercial uh, properties. We have not seen policy mandates yet on retrofitting or some sort of leak loss program. So on new buildings, you might see something like that. Of course, that's not when you're in an acute drought, that's kind of a longer term solution. But there, you know, part of what made the economics on this work is the fact that Metropolitan Water District of Southern California was able to top up and make it more uh, an economic incentive for the, the building owners to be able to make these investments, which again, I think is going to reinforce the case for expanding this for others that might be interested in, in, in replicating the program. I would turn to Cora about how that interface with the tenants um, uh, played out in the project itself, but I will say that, um, so, um, you know, part of the problem in a in multi uh, family dwellings is the, the, the fact that water is kind of managed by the building owner and is kind of like lost in the, the, the rent payments scheme, if you see what I mean, there's not direct billing of the tenant for water use. So there's kind of these weird misincentives, right? They're not aligned. Um, we did talk about different ways that the tenants more directly would benefit from the project. And there were some ideas on what this could look like, but for the sake of the decision to let's keep it simple, prove what this can looks like, and then add some of those layers of complexity over time is something that we took as a decision just so that we could get the proof of concept down. I would like to see some sort of that financial benefit. If I've got some maintenance person coming into my apartment that I get the $250 rebate that's coming out of the thing. But that was hard to, to, um, to work into the scope of the project in the initial phases. So over time, that, I think that's where I would like to see it grow. And um, um, do you have any thoughts on how the, how that project implementers interface with the tenants themselves? I don't know the details of that. Can you answer that? Yeah, I think I skipped that side. Um, uh, that's a really great observation and it's something that we did think about and ultimately kind of decided to go with like a minimum viable product kind of for the first pilot but um, we really relied on the technology provider sensor industries to in, they were the primary interface with the property and the property managers and you know if you know someone who manages a property whether it's a multifamily building or a you know commercial industrial site those people are in incredibly busy and they ha have responsibility for so much and um, we really tried to minimize the kind of effort and impact on them uh, but I think in doing so we did miss an opportunity around educating or informing tenants and um, that all went through the property manager and their existing relationships with the tenants um, but that is something that we're now looking at for scaling is uh, there's a, a another project that's currently underway that's actually in student housing and there's a very clear education component with that. And so we're looking at how do we do resident education. Um, we attempted to deploy surveys with these residents and got you know very few responses due to the demographics, but that's something else that we're looking at. Um, and as Jason just mentioned, are there ways to actually direct the financial benefits of these projects and make sure that they make their way directly back to the tenants? Um, so those are all things that we are continuing to explore and certainly lessons learned from this first pilot. So two big questions left, um, the government role question, but maybe easier for, for right away, um, making that business case, bringing in more companies, helping build this private sector engagement. Um, Shannon and Tara, any reflections on what that looked like for you or how we could build that case with other parties, other possible investors? Yeah, so um, I think just the, the like the success right like we've been talking a lot about the project and trying to trying to kind of shop it around almost um so just doing that and letting the results speak for themselves i think is is already proving to be fruitful as you saw scaling to four different places um 
I think I wanted to mention something about the your question on the residents. I, that was always top of mind. I, I think there's a balance that we really try to strike where, you know, they're not asking for any of this. They should just be living their life like like normal as they want. And so not having no trade-offs, their experience should not be worse. Like they shouldn't not get their shampoo out of their hair because we've installed an aerator or something like that. Like trying to find that middle ground where we're saving while not impacting their experience. So that will always be top of mind, I think for as the projects move forward. Um, so yeah, but you could, I, th I think the last question was on, um, was on how to what how do you make a project like attractive to other companies, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think um, there's there's not really like any shortcuts to be honest. I think that the I th this really demonstrated like the relationships are really important, especially when you're working at at the local level. So I think building building the relationship, building trust, um, demonstrating uh, potentially. I mean, if if it would be even more attractive if like I came in now and saw the success, it'd be like, okay, yeah, let's keep going. But um, showing really like that you've, that you have this, a potential for success and then um, an opportunity to potentially scale. So I think, uh, and then also looking at the company and what their targets and goals are and making sure that you really highlight the results of this project, like what benefits will directly help that company achieve their targets and goals as well. I would just add that, you know, certainly the, the companies and the corporations you see at World Water Week, we all have water stewardship strategies and goals and, and commitments. And um, again, as, as Shannon mentioned, like looking at those goals are, looking at where companies are operating and where our footprints are, that helps kind of give a sense of where there might be groups who are interested in, in partnering those opportunities or um, likewise. I think Quack, of course, like a group like Quack is is a great forum. It's, it's pretty unique um, in terms of having such an action-oriented group of NGO and company, corporate partners who are, who are focused on water. Um, that itself has been scaled to Texas has one as well. Um, so those types of forums and groups um, are also good venues as well. Um, going back to your question about, you know, how to build on the program and to to engage more with the residents, I think one parallel that came to mind for me is a lot of utilities have been doing um, energy efficiency programs. So, you know, they're not just going into apartments and changing out LED light bulbs. They're also doing like weather stripping around the windows and other kind of energy saving tactics. So, you know, thinking about what Jason mentioned as a potential for scaling, like, are we doing the aerators at the same time? Are we installing um, low flow faucets? Um, I think those are all really great ideas to, to carry forth and to think about as this type of project scales to, to new locations. Great. Um, as an entity that represents hundreds of projects to companies, I'll kind of just quickly summarize, I, I think Jason used the word pathway. Pathway is incredibly important to engage companies. You have to create a very straightforward path for them to understand and participate in a project, right? So if we had pitched a project like that and just said, oh, we have a big idea, we're not sure if they're going to come on, maybe it'll happen in 2025, no chance, right? So it has to provide a very clear pathway. And a couple of things that the panels emphasized, one was the co-benefits. Sometimes a project um, representative will say, we're going to save a lot of water in these buildings without representing those co-benefits, social equity, benefiting underserved communities, energy benefits, carbon benefits, those are things that often are, are instrumental to help illustrate those additional benefits in a project package. Contracting for companies, making that very simple, making that fit their timelines, making their budgets um, you know, um, active within the timeframe for contracting. Um, and benefits. Many, many times companies are motivated by near-term benefits and having a project that has the ability to be constructed and generating benefits in a year or year and a half is another fundamental piece of that puzzle to make something attractive and increase the number of private sector entities that might choose to participate in that. So pivot to the question on government role. I love this question. I'm not exactly sure who might wanna take a first stab at it. 
where does that go where should where does that government role begin and end i'll even open it up to the guest panelist cora anyone want to jump in on this um it's a very good question it's a very complicated question i don't have the answer um but i think one of the the challenges is that it varies you know water governance varies place by place and you know thinking about california there's regional management, there's state management, there's federal management, and it's with all the different entities. Um, it's it's water governance is a challenge. Yeah, I mean, I think well, this project, the you know Pacific Institute and BF sort of did a landscape ready and filled a gap, right? And so I think like just right now we need to act, and so we filled a gap, but also included the um the agent an, an agency and i think you kind of answered that already in, in the um the rebates they were able to bring and so it was sort of like identifying a gap bringing an opportunity to them as well and um hopefully working to scale that and give give it to them and you know wrapped up in a nice little package that they'll be able to um uh, replicate it not only in los angeles but in other places as well yeah, I think policy mandates take a long time to implement, right? So is it new buildings? And then what's the timeline of new buildings that are built in an area? I I think the, the financial augmentation is a big part of what the role of the public sector can be. And I want to also credit MWD for project work they've done on toilet replacement projects for a long time. And um, if anyone's familiar with this, uh, it, it was kind of a really a journey, uh, because if you think about it, if you're an importer of water supply, you've got to calculate the marginal cost of new, new supply for your areas, right? And building a dam or another dam and then conveying that water 150 miles down to Southern California, it's pretty expensive on a unit measure for marginal supply. So long time ago, MWD introduced a program that was about toilet repates will give you $250 off if you move from a six gallon per flush toilet down to a, a, a 1.8 or a two, whatever it was at the time. And that program was so oversubscribed that they you know, had success with it. But then the next time I think they said, we'll install the toilet for you and uh, it will give it to you for free and we'll install it. And then it was still on a cost savings basis more than marginal cost of uh, alternative supply from import. So once a project like this can prove that's effective, then I would think a fair ask is put the money behind it to make those incentives play out for those that are going to implement the technology and go with it. And the role of these unlikely alliances of, of corporate and NGOs is to find that next innovative thing that's not being done, get it off the ground, prove that it works, and then have that scaling happen through public sector financing. And there's a lot of federal and state money right now looking to build climate resilience in our water systems. And as I said at the outset, conservation efficiency programs in municipal utility districts is one of the most climate resilient strategies you can do because the water you already spent all the time and energy to get to the place in the first place. Great. Cora, do you want to get in on this? <laughs> you worked at a policy thing. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that the I'll, I'll speak to water utilities in particular because I think talking about the role of the public sector that's it's quite broad, right? So talking not about policymakers per se, but about public water utilities whose mandate is to provide you know safe and affordable drinking water to residents. And uh, we we talked about uncertainty and risk in projects like this, and those kinds of public agencies tend to be quite risk averse, right? They have a very particular you know public service uh, to provide. And they have to be very, you know, fiscally responsible and make sure that they meet that mandate first. Metropolitan Water District, the partner on this, I would say, is you know much more um, willing to try out these new innovations. They're very well resourced compared to a lot of other water utilities in California and certainly around the world. Um, so I think that's a bit of a unique situation. But I think what we're seeing now that we have demonstrated success in this project, thanks to the participation and engagement of corporate and NGO partners, is that other water utilities around California are starting to ask us, oh wait, what was that project? Like, Could, could you tell us about that? Could we set up a call? Now we wanna hear about it. Um, and I think that 
that that's why projects like this can be so catalytic because it is the role of these public water utilities to adopt strategies like this, um, but they often need the proof first. And so that's why I think this project has been you know, incredibly helpful in that way. Yeah, I think we probably open it up. Yeah, open it up for questions. Yes. Uh, my name is uh, my name is Rudiger Heidrich from Germany, German Water Associations. I just wanted to uh, recommend on what you said. What is a game of the government to cut down? When I saw the figures, 127 gallons per person per day. We have in Germany 24 liters per person per day. Four, four and a half times less water in Germany used than in California. That's what I just learned from this session. Uh, we have toilets which are four to six liters. I just heard the figure six gallons. Long time ago. Long time ago. Yeah, yeah. So they're not being so, replaced. And of course, when you go to the hotels here, you have two buttons to press. Yeah. So for the big business and the small business. So I think these are things, and that of course is a thing, job of the government to introduce this kind of uh, strategy. I think that that's I think very important. It's not the job of the government to change toilets, but to, to give the regulator. In Germany, every household has to have a water meter. When it comes to payment, the people understand this is something what I have to save. I think that's the only language what I think it's international. When you pay for it, you think about it. That's the only thing what I believe is the right way to, to educate people <laughs> when it comes to the money. Super, super great points. And directly to Jason's point in these multifamily housing units, um, there is no payment from tenants, right? So the disincentive in that is kind of at its worst in that regard. Uh, those are great points. Um, any thoughts on on those points, panelists? Or No, I think regulatory mandates, I, if my lapel mic's on, are, are really what drive the market over time. I guess, you know, we do now have requirements about 1.8 gallon flush toilets in California and or 1.6 now, 1.2 are the most efficient ones, 1.2 gallons per flush. But again, like what is the policy that incentivizes retrofit for built units in a place that has 20 million people living? And that's a, a different sort of regulatory hammer to put in place unless you're talking about new buildings. So I think you, it's what is going to be the fastest way to get this increased water security for a water stressed region? And so there is a policy incentive, both with a hammer and with carrots. But I also think trying to demonstrate what these innovations are like and then showing the economics behind it are one of the fastest way to scale them, you know, because people will see the incentive built in inherently. And I think that's why we find the project to be really in, in, um, compelling. Well, I want Leah's raising. Do you want to speak a little bit to the 50 liter home coalition? <laughs> Actually, the 50 liter home coalition leader is right over there, <laughs> Braulio. Um, so we kind of like it within the company, within PG had started thinking about this vision and, and the coalition has adopted that vision as well, going from 500 liters per person per day, which is the average um, household water usage in, in the United States, um, to 50, liter, 50 liters per person per day without any trade-offs. So really like maintaining the experience because we also know that if someone does not have a good experience with a water efficient product or a water efficient fixture, they're not going to use it. They'll take out the aerator and they'll just keep using it as they were. So really delighting the consumer the same way that we try to do with our products and innovations, but doing that in a way that has uh, multiple benefits, including the reduction of water use and the re reduction of um, energy. And so um, the 50 liter home coalition, I think it's been about a little over a year since it formally kicked off. And there are several different um, companies through the WBCSD that are members of that coalition driving towards that lighthouse vision and working to set up pilots, working to um, also influence policy. I mean, there's some places where the reuse of water in homes is illegal. And so, you know, how do you also influence the policy in order to make that change? So um, meet with Braulio over here if you want to learn a little bit more, but I think there's definitely synergies. And what I also loved about this project was that, like, even though the innovation itself and that leak detection sensor is uh, complex and I don't, I can't 
explain the innards of it or like how it connects to the cloud but it's a simple it's like this problem has been in existence since toilets were invented and it's it's like such an easy simple thing to do to just like reduce the baseline use and then start to build up from there and continue to reduce towards that vision of 50 liters per person per day so it fits in very well, I think, to what that coalition is trying to do, what we'd like to do as PNG, and um, what the what all the different needs, right? The city needs everyone. It's just win, 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 win. So <laughs> all the wins. So please um, join me in thanking the panel for a tremendous discussion. Thank you all. And I'm going to pivot to closing remarks here uh, with Jason, but I just want to thank you um, for choosing to participate in this session and, and helping us talk about this and celebrate this project. Um, and some of the other folks that are in the room that participated as well. Um, Coca-Cola, John just walked in, another partner on the project. So great to have him here. So, so I'm going to hand it off to Jason to close us out here and just thank you again for the opportunity to present. <coughs> I'll try to do this very quickly because I, I, I think it was a great session, but there's not a need for me to use the remaining five minutes to summarize my lapel mic live. So um, first want to thank again, all of you for being here. I really want to thank Cora for leading on this project. This project would not have happened the way it, it did without Cora specifically, not just the, the Pacific Institute and the other partners, Cora Kamer. And I really want to appreciate Cora for that. Uh, there was a lot of uh, creativity and tenacity needed to really chase this vision all the way through to a project that delivered the way it did. Um, you know, I usually say this or do this at the beginning instead of saving it at the end, but like climate change and its impact on water systems is going to happen way faster than everyone's talking about. And most of the people that are close to water are starting to recognize this. So it is an all hands on deck moment and it's open all doors that are available. So there is a dire need for consortiums of stakeholders that care about water to come together and start taking action in innovative ways that we haven't done it. This is an example that it can be done. There are loads and loads of other examples, but we need to move fast and we need to be ready to be leaning in on trust-based relationships and to try to have this transformational impact. That's the main message. And I also want to just say that the role of the business community in trying to get some of these innovative ideas off the ground before they can get to scale, just to prove the concept, can't be understated. That, that's so important to get it going, and then you can see these other pathways that get you to scale, but just really want to um, encourage uh, other businesses that are in the room to really think about that role that they can play to bring this, the seed uh, funding to enable this stuff to get off the, the ground. So I hope you guys all have a great rest of your World Water Week. Thanks for being here today, and hopefully we'll see you at other sessions. Thank mm -hmm. you.